Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, on today's episode, we are reviewing Knave 2nd Edition, and Knave 2nd Edition is of course from Ben Milton, the incredibly uh, popular YouTuber on Questing Beast and game designer with Knave. This was insanely successful on Kickstarter, so I know that a lot of people have copies in their hands now. But in the in the kind of pantheon of modern indie RPGs, there are kind of three pillars, I think, and three games that a lot of people talk about a lot. And those are Into the Odd from Chris McDowell and uh, Cairn from Yochai Gal. And right, Yochai Gal, yep, Yochai Gal. And uh, both of these I do have experience with. We've taken a look at Cairn on the channel before in a kind of roundabout way with Rune Cairn. And also uh, we deal in lead and um, into the odd. I haven't yet taken a look at, but I do have experience with both of these. I do not have any or I did not have any experience at all with a uh, knave first edition. The only thing from Ben that I do have is maze rats. And I thought maze rats was pretty cool. It's a good collection of tables that you can use. And uh, Nave is, is is somewhat similar, and I know that people uh, like Nave a lot, so we're going to be talking about it. Now, this is the first video that I'm going to introduce something on, and we'll probably return to this metric as we talk more about uh, RPG systems, and that is the solo score. Uh, as everybody knows, or, or new people to the channel, as you will find out, 99% uh, of the games that I cover on the Dungeon Dive are from the solo perspective. That's how I enjoy most of the games that I play, and that's how I spend uh, the vast majority of my time gaming is solo. And that goes with board games and RPGs. And so I'm uh, developing a, a, a solo score. Now, the solo score is not a grade. Uh, it, it's not a, an A plus, B plus. You don't think of it in terms of a grade. Don't think of a, of a low score as being a bad game. It's a, it's, it's a spectrum. And it's a scale. On one end, you have a one, and those are games that I would never recommend for solo play. Those are games, something like Fiasco, games that rely 100% on their social interaction as mechanisms and to generate the fun of the game. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have a, a 10 would be something like uh, like Cernithalis or Thousand Year Vampire, something that is designed specifically for solo play. And I would not recommend those games for multiplayer or they're just not designed at all for multiplayer play. So Nave on the on the on the solo score, I'm giving it a, a, a five out of ten. It's somewhere right in the middle. Uh, Nave is not meant for solo play. There isn't a chapter on how to facilitate solo play. It's not an official option or even really a consideration. And hey, you know what? That's totally OK. Uh, not all games need to have a, a, a chapter dedicated to how to play solo, but it is doable, especially with an Oracle. So with an Oracle, I'm giving the solo score a 7 out of 10 if you wanted to play Nave uh, solo. And for an Oracle, I would recommend something a little more robust. And I would recommend uh, something like Random Realities from Cesar Capacol. Uh, we've taken a look at this before. This is a fantastic oracle with all kinds of information for generating anything that you would need. Or what you might want to take a look at is the Little GM Emulator from Gustavo Coelho. And we've taken a look at some of his games before, uh, Little Town and Eldritch Town and just recently Caves and Catacombs. And this is a new little uh, oracle zine that he uh, that he put out. And this is a copy. I got a PDF from itch.io. And uh, this is a copy that I printed out and made myself. And this is a really, really cool oracle. Speaking of oracles, we are going to be taking a look at a bunch of oracles soon. We'll be flipping through my oracle book where I just have all kinds of different oracles, uh, ranging from little simple one pagers to more complex things like the two that we just took a look at. But I'm putting together a few more and coming up with some notes for some others so we can take a detailed look at all of these amazing oracles that are available to help you facilitate solo play for games that are not specifically designed for solo play. Now, Nave as a tool for using Nave as a tool for other games to generate uh, things for your solo play, I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. And that's because it is absolutely overflowing with awesome tables 
that can be used for generating just about everything you would want to in a kind of typical D&D style fantasy world. There are so many tables, as a matter of fact, that I made my own PDF of just the tables, of just the generating, the, the things that generate um, ideas and encounters and content for a game. And it was 52 pages of tables, just overflowing with tables. So Nave as a tool to help facilitate play with other games is very, very valuable. I'd say it's worth the price of the book just for all of the tools. And we'll be taking a little bit of a deeper look at all of the tables as we do look through the book. So Nave second edition, again, from Ben Milton with art by Peter Mullen. Uh, fans of Dungeon Crawl Classics will, of course, recognize the art. One thing I appreciate, and it was also something I, that I appreciated in Cairn and Rune Cairn and We Deal in Lead, is when an RPG kind of lays out the 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 the, uh, the duties, the game master duties, the player duties, what is expected of the people who are playing the game. And there are a few things that I did like in this section, and that is that the players guide the action. So GMs let the players dictate the flow of the story. Don't over plan. Go with the flow. Roll up lots of random things. Give the players agency keep the game moving. I think that's really important to keep in mind, especially as uh, solo players. Sometimes we can get bogged down in, in looking things up and uh, we can get bogged down during a game of like, oh, I have this perfect tool for that. Oh, what was it? Where was this one chart I had in this book? Uh, let me put the game down and I'm going to go to my shelves and dig through all of my zines and all of my, P all of my PDFs and all of my stacks of paper and find this one perfect tool when often we can just kind of uh, go with the flow and keep the game moving. That is really, really important. Uh, you can go and find your perfect tools in between game sessions. Um, another thing was using time as a resource. I know time as a resource is something that is really important to Ben. He has a whole video on the old timekeeping methods in original D&D and how important that is to, to, uh, to the game. And using time as a resource, time is a precious commodity to the adventurer, especially when they are in precarious situations. And so keeping uh, using time as a resource is a very important element to this game, as are uh, using as is using items as a resource. Items can be broken to do cool things. You can lose items as you lose hit points. You can use the ability to carry items as you take damage and so on. So items and uh, time are a very important element to a game of Knave. Uh, character creation. Character creation is super simple and I like it. It's a classless system, although it does have careers and careers are used to give your characters a backstory and some uh, some items and some gear to start off with. So we have our typical fantasy ability scores, our stats. We have strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. And each one of those is associated with an archetype. It's associated with a common uh, fantasy archetype. So of course, strength would be your fighter, dexterity, your rogue, constitution, your adventurer, intelligence, your mage, wisdom, a ranger, and charisma, a cleric. And your ability scores range from zero to 10. And the ability scores are basically the modifier that you add when you want to do a challenge. And challenges are pretty simple in Nave. You take a base score of 11, you add or subtract any modifiers to get a target number. Usually that target number is 16 and you roll a D20 and you add any modifiers and you have to meet or beat that score. So with a target value of 16, that means that a new character can have about a 25% to 40% chance of doing something heroic, of, of accomplishing the task that they set out to accomplish. And that's because your characters will start with three points in their ability scores. Now you can either assign those points to make the character that you want to, or you can roll randomly. And I think this is really cool. It's a really neat way to randomly roll up a character. So each one of these stats corresponds to a number ranging from one to six. You roll 3d6 and you assign one point to the numbers that are rolled. So let's take a look here. Okay, so five, five, and four. 
So four, we would go uh, score one point in our intelligence, which would be a mage, and then two points in our five. So we are kind of, we are a magic using ranger. Really neat way to create a character. Everything else would start off at zero. So you could make a really powerful fighter by just giving your initial three points in strength or your initial three points in intelligence if you wanted to be a powerful magic user. But I really like this really something. I there is a character, 444. Four, four. Hey, uh, we are a mage there. We would have three points in intelligence. Or here we have four, one, and two. So two would be a rogue. And one would be a fighter and a mage, a fighter rogue mage. Hey, that's kind of like Elric in a way. At least Elric, a, a very young, uh, a very young, naive Elric or something like that. But uh, so, yeah, that's the way that you create characters. That's pretty much it. You start with a, a D6 at maximum hit points. So you don't have a lot of hit points. Uh, we would have two hit points there. All right. However, your items are also your hit points or your kind of like your wounds. And you start with 10 item slots plus your charisma modifier or your constitution modifier. So my constitution modifier is a zero. So right now I have a maximum of 10 item slots. When my HP reaches zero, then I start crossing off my item slots from 10 up. And any items that are in those slots, those get lost. Those get uh, either they're damaged. Uh, you can think of your items as critical wounds, as direct damage. Uh, some damage will do direct damage and that bypasses your XP completely and just starts crossing off your, uh, your item slots. I think that's a pretty cool thing. Now, we also have a couple of careers. We get to choose two careers or we can roll. Uh, let's roll randomly here. And those will be D100 rolls, D100. So let's, uh, our first career here is a 47. So a 47, that will give us a hunter. And as a hunter, I start with a tent, a bear skin, and a bear trap. All right. And what is my second career here? Uh, 92, a squire, a torch, armor polish, and a trumpet. So those would be all of the things I start with. And then I believe you also start with uh, a little bit of gold. Uh, your armor class. So your armor class always starts at 11 plus your armor points. And you get one point of armor for every piece of armor that your character is wearing up to seven. So if you had some chest armor and a helmet, you would get two. And then you would add those together for 13 would be your armor class. And 13, that would be your target number that enemies have to roll to hit you. Uh, pretty simple. I do like that system there. All characters start at level one as you gain experience. And in this game, gold is experience. Treasure is experience. You All of the characters level up at the same rate. And you go from a level one wretch all the way up to a level 10, a knave. And when you level up, you get to add three, uh, one point to three different um, ability scores. So that's how you level up is just your ability scores go up. So that would mean that your modify that you get to uh, modify your dice rolls for doing challenges and so on. And you become better at all of the things that you want your hero to be better at. I love the character system in this. It's very simple. If your character dies, you can literally have a new character up and ready to go in just a few seconds. But there is some flexibility, especially in this D100 careers. And just a simple way that you can assign a single point to an attribute in order to become um, more like that archetypical character that the attribute corresponds to. So after the character section, we get into our section on checks. I've kind of gone over that before. You start with a base 11 and then you add modifiers to make the target number. And then you roll a d20 and you add any modifiers and you're trying to meet or beat that particular target number to accomplish the thing that you want to accomplish. And after the checks, we move into the fun stuff. We move into generating things for travel and for encounters and for all of the random tables. So traveling is pretty interesting in this game. 
you have uh, six different watches, six different periods, three in the morning, three in the afternoon. It basically takes one watch to move a hex. That's about six miles. If you move more than three hexes without resting, you start taking direct damage. So direct damage bypasses your hit points. It's kind of a forced march. You start taking fatigue damage and your ability to, to hold items goes down. Uh, one watch equals about four hours, like I said. It takes about one watch or it takes one watch to fully explore a hex. You do a wisdom check in order to prevent, uh, to stop yourself from getting lost. It takes one watch to forage for 1d6 rations. So uh, think of watches as your actions and you take those in turn, but you do also have to rest. When you, at, at the end of the day, you will roll your hazard die. So this is where this game starts to get into kind of this solo play. If you wanted to, uh, you could roll a D6 at the end of each day and a five, you have a sign. So the players find a sign and then you can turn to page 10 here and there are D100 signs. So what would we find here? Um, a four, we find uh, blade marks on something, maybe some blade marks on a tree. Are those natural blade marks or are they made by some kind of smithed weapon? Uh, maybe they look like claw marks. So there's some kind of werewolf or something out in the forest. Uh, we have different locations that you can roll on while you are traveling. Uh, maybe we come across a 49. We come across a, a lake and in the middle of a lake is a is a water mill. So a flooded water mill. Maybe it's not a lake. Maybe it's a, a large body of shallow water with a water mill or a, a some kind of mill, a water. Um, what did I say? Yeah, water mill. And uh, what are the traits here? 11. Um, and it's burning down. Oh, that's kind of ironic, right? Is that ironic? I don't know. Sometimes irony confuses me. But uh, so in the middle of this field of water, uh, there is uh, this this uh, shallow pond is a water mill and the water mill is on fire. And maybe some people are standing around uh, scooping up buckets of water, trying to put this water mill out of uh, uh, trying to put the, the fire out. And you come along as a wandering hero and you land, uh, lend a hand in order to help them do that. But as you're traveling, you can have an encounter, you can become fatigued, you can have depletion where your uh, things that are perishable uh, start to, to uh, deplete. Uh, you can have a travel shift and travel shifts are things that just happen. And this is a really cool way to roll up random charts as well, or random, um, random occurrences, I should say, random events. So we might have an eight. Um, a ball lightning. So we see ball lightning and maybe we confuse it for some kind of UFO or something or a 21. Uh, there is some kind of disaster. Sometimes the tables will reference other tables. So disaster on page 31 here. All right. What kind of disaster did we come across while we were traveling? 21. Um, a dream plague. What the heck is a dream plague? I don't know. That would be something that we would want to uh, to look into. Maybe that could be a quest or something to figure out what a dream plague is. So again, the charts are very, very handy for traveling. We have signs, locations, structures and place traits. And then we get into delving. So this is our dungeon diving here. And again, we have a hazard chart from an encounter, fatigue, burn, a delve, shift, a sign and a no, no encounter. When you are dungeon crawling, every action takes about 10 minutes. So things are kind of shrunken down a little more focused. And when you are dungeon diving, of course, you do have shifts here. So we are in the middle of a dungeon and the shift is an eight. I've rolled an eight, I think three times in this video. Um, the ceiling moves. Oh, no, there's maybe the ceiling starts dropping. Maybe it is a trap. Um, a six. Man, this thing is like hitting zero, zero a lot, isn't it? Um, a blessing. We come across a blessing. So we find something good in the dungeon. A 69. And uh, what is 69 is that uh, the passage is open and we can come across rooms so we can stumble upon different rooms. A 64. 64 is a menagerie. Uh, room details, room themes, different dungeon themes, different trap effects, different hazards, different mechanisms all kinds of cool things to encounter in a dungeon. And then we get into the encounter section. Here we have a 2D6 chart to roll up what the thing is doing, what the people are doing, what the monster is doing. How do they react to you? Anywhere from they want to kill the PCs to they ask to join the PCs party with a seven right in the middle being ignore the PCs. 
What are they doing when we come across them? Well, we have this D100 chart of, of um, activities. They could be cooking, preaching, going on a mission, uh, murdering, selling, celebrating. So all kinds of different things. And then that leads into the combat section. Combat, again, is pretty simple. You have a target number based on 11 plus either the monsters level or the PC's armor class. And that becomes a target level. You roll a d20, add modifiers and, and meet or beat that. There are things called maneuvers and maneuvers are things like stunning, blinding, climbing, restraining. Uh, those are things that don't cause damage, but add to the tactical or the strategic elements of the combat. And when you do a critical strike, and that's when your your uh, combat roll is 21 or higher, you get to also perform a free maneuver in that round of combat. So that's kind of cool. It, it adds a little bit of a narrative to the combat. It's the spells. All right. The magic system here is really, really cool. So I don't use magic a lot in the games that I play. I prefer to, I prefer to have magic going on in the background or maybe... Uh, going up against opponents who are magical, I personally don't like keeping track of spells for characters. So that's why I tend to avoid magic. But this game has a random chart of D100 spells. But you can also generate new spells. And this is so much fun. I love this. So you have a spell formula and you roll a D12 to determine the spell formula. So let's roll that here. All right. This is a nine. So we have... Nine. It's the wizard's name, the effect, and the element. Okay, so let's uh, create this spell here. So the wizard's name, we have a D100. Of course, this is very fancy in here, uh, Dying Earth style spells here. So we have 64. Okay, so this is um, Perdeo's, Perdeo's effect. Let's go to our effect table. So this is Perdeo's 48. Perdeo's identifying and element. Perdeo's identifying 100 wood. Okay, so uh, this maybe this uh, magic user is a a, a wood a a, a a carpenter, and so he has developed a magic spell to help him identify the wood of any kind of structure that he wants or something like that. But we have different, so you have an element on form, effect in form, wizard's name, and quality and effect. So we have qualities, effects, elements, and forms, different types of mutations, different delusions, disasters, and a whole chart on magic schools. Really fun to come up with all kinds of magical abilities. I think having access to these random magic tables might allow me or give me the... Um, give me a, a reason to include more magic in my solo games. We also have a whole bunch of charts on relic magic. So those are items that cause magic. So those can be from different domains, a whole bunch of different symbols, icons, um, a whole bunch of things for different types of alchemy, for different potions, textures, tastes, colors, and ingredients. So if you like mixing potions, there's a lot of stuff for you to do in this game. Um, equipment is, is relatively easy. Again, you can have up to seven pieces of armor to help uh, bolster your armor class. And those are shields, helmets, gambesons, male shirts, breastplates, arm plate, and leg plate. And all of those have the same cost. So uh, item itemization is relatively simple in Nave. Uh, all of the, you know, all of the swords are kind of the same. They're either one-handed or two-handed, but then it's up to the player to come up with the details about their weapon. We also have a cost of living uh, chart from being destitute, which is 90 coins per month, all the way up to royalty, which is 600,000 coins per month. We have a D100 chart for tools, for miscellaneous items, for books, clothing, fabrics, decorations, treasures, materials, weapons, and item traits. And then we get into our section about buildings and warfare. So this is kind of large scale battles. Now, this is the only part where I think the books, uh, the organization is a little odd because we have buildings and then warfare, but the charts that follow warfare seem to have more to do with buildings. I think maybe I would have moved warfare to uh, after the subsequent charts here, which include your city themes, your city events, your street details, all of your building details. We have our in name one and two, our food traits and our different food 
factions, faction traits, missions, and rewards. Maybe, um, maybe warfare should have gone right here. Missions and rewards. This is really this is the part where I wish that this game had a little bit more, uh, a little bit more in terms of generating, and that's generating quests and generating plots. It doesn't have a lot of things to help you to help the soloist get going. Once you get going, the book is overflowing with helpful charts, but getting going um, takes a little bit of an effort. And so that's why I do give this game a five. It's kind of right in the middle of that. But if you take something like either of the two um, emulators we looked at, the little GM emulator or the random realities, you should be able to get going pretty quickly and come up with a plot and come up with some uh, some quests to get your game going. And then we also have downtime and downtime. You can actually earn XP in downtime by gambling because since gold is XP, the more gold you gain, the more XP you gain because you can pay to get trained. And you can also recruit different uh, helpers, different henchmen. We have different types of art. We have different archetypes of people you can recruit, such as the salty mariner or the gentleman thief or the hard boiled sleuth or a swashbuckler, a classy courtesan or a melancholy queen. And then we have a whole bunch of charts for NPCs, uh, male names, female names, surnames, one and two personalities, NPC details, professions, goals, assets, liabilities, relationships, and mannerisms. And then we get into our section on monsters. So we have a D100 monster chart here. We have an example bestiary, and we have a way to generate our uh, some of our beasts, some of our monsters. Monsters have your typical stats like they would in any kind of basic fantasy. You have armor class, hit points, level, the number of attacks, how fast or how far they move, the morale and the number appearing. When you want to generate things, we have uh, you can generate animals, different organs, uh, different monster traits and powers, sense, sounds, tactics and weaknesses. Very cool. Coming up with random monsters is super fun, a lot like coming up with different spells. And then we have a gameplay example. And finally, the last section here is a section that I really like, and this is designer's commentary. And Ben has gone in here and addressed kind of the major points of this game and why he chose to do with them what he did. For instance, I really like this uh, uh, this commentary on random tables. And Ben says, much, much is often made of whether a game's rules are good, but in my view, the actual content of a game, the situations, locations, events, NPCs, often has a bigger impact, impact on the experience than mechanics. I totally agree with that. Uh, mechanisms are kind of a dime a, dime a dozen. Mechanisms come and go. We can choose and, and pick mechanisms. That, like It's easy to find mechanisms. It's hard to find that meaty stuff. And for me, when I pick up a RPG, I like a lot of random tables. And that is one of the first things I look at is how easy is it for me as a solo player to generate the things that I need on the fly while I am playing. And some books really fail on that. And I don't typically like those kinds of RPGs. Whereas if I picked this up in a store, not knowing anything about it, and I started flipping through this and I saw all of these tables, I would think, yes, this is a game that I can use even just as a tool for generating things for my solo game. So I really appreciate Ben's focus on random tables. And then he also, in each of the major topics, he gives his inspiration. So the inspiration for his random tables, uh, was The Perilous Wilds by Jason Lutz and Augmented Reality by Paul Gallagher. I am familiar with The Perilous Wilds. I am not familiar with Aug Augmented Reality. So that gives me something to research now. And each one of these lists his inspiration. And so if you're looking for more inspiration, if you're looking for more games to, to research, this is a fantastic section. It's kind of like an appendix in for the things that been for the, the the systems, the games that been used to inspire him in the creation of Nave and Nave Second Edition. So yeah, overall, I think this is a pretty great book. It's nice and small. It's compact. It's very well made. It's it's uh, the the binding is nice. The stitching is nice. The art is nice. All of the tables are nice. I would just say if you're looking for something solo that you can play just with the one book, this is not the game. This is not that game. This doesn't have solo rules. It doesn't have a built-in oracle. It doesn't have a chapter on how 
to facilitate solo play. So just know if you're looking to go into Nave second edition solo, that while it can be a fantastic tool to generate things, maybe for other games, you will need a little help from an emulator to get your game going and to help handle some of the GM duties. So, all right, you guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this review of Nave second edition. We will talk to you later. Bye-bye.